All right, I see that we've got a lot of people on already. There might be a few filter in as I begin some of the uh, preliminaries, but uh, to start off, uh, good evening to everyone that's joined us. Welcome to our first and hopefully our last and only online virtual book launch. Uh, my name is Jordan Ignatchik. I'm the executive director with Nature Saskatchewan. I'll be your host moderator for the event. I would first like to just start off by acknowledging that uh, Nature Saskatchewan acknowledges treaties 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10 signed between the Crown and Indigenous peoples of Saskatchewan, Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Cinnaboyne, Blackfoot, and Dene Nations. We also acknowledge that it's many uh, Métis communities who identify Saskatchewan as their homeland. Um, just start off with a little bit of sort of the, the housekeeping items that uh, and you'll all probably have recognized your microphones and videos are disabled. And that's just to avoid any disruptions of the presentations as they're going on. Um, we will have a question and answer at the end of the presentations and you can enter your questions using uh, the Q&A sort of button down along the bottom of your screen. If you're not familiar with Zoom, it's there. You can enter those in. Um, I'll be monitoring these through the presentations and you can enter them at any time through the, the presentations for the evening. And then at the end of it, then we'll just sort of start with uh, uh, presenting the questions to the, the authors and, uh, and move them along from there. Um, the chat function can also be used if you have any technical problems. Um, our communications manager, Ellen Bouvier is also on the call and, and can monitor those along the way. And just to sort of uh, let everybody know that the webinar presentation is being recorded and then we'll be posting it up on our YouTube uh, page uh, probably within a day or two. So if you wanna rewatch it or if you wanna just let people know that, that it is available that way. I'm pleased to be able to introduce to you tonight our two authors for the Backyard Bird Feeding a Saskatchewan Guide. Trevor Harriet is a prairie naturalist, birder and award-winning author. He's active in several national and provincial conservation groups and appears regularly on CBC radio as the guest expert on Birdline, call-in show devoted to wild birds in Saskatchewan. Myrna Pierman is recently retired as the biologist, site service manager at Ellis Bird Farm, where she spearheaded many conservation, education, and research initiatives. A keen photographer and writer, she's authored and co-authored numerous books, writes nature photo essays for several magazines, and is actively involved with the Red Deer River Naturalists. He was recently named a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. I will now turn things over to Trevor and Myrna. I hope you enjoy the presentations and I'll be back to address your questions later on. Hey, thank you very much, Jordan. I want to start by just welcoming everybody out there. Uh, uh, I hope everybody's enjoying the birds of spring. The weather's taken a bit of a, bit of a dip, but we're all very grateful for the rain. Watching the fancy brushes and so on coming through our yards. Hey, I saw bee-headed vireo first time this year and uh yeah it's a great time of year the time of year we all love as bird watchers i want to start by thanking nature saskatchewan for taking this project on and allowing Myrna and i to work together to publish this book along with all the photographers who contributed it started really with uh, a conversation with my good friend ed roger who's the the um, chair of the board of nature fast and he said yeah it might be something we could look at when we talk to to Donna Bruce and Jordan, and so we did that, and Jordan and Donna were very, very good to work with, and we had, you know, a, a very easy ride of it, I think, over, over the last few months through this winter preparing the book, and it wouldn't have been possible without the tremendous contributions from so many wonderful photographers who generously allowed us to use their images in, in the book. I especially want to make a shout out for the, the photographers who are participants in the Fast Living Facebook page. As anybody who know, knows who's looked at that page, there's just terrific photographers there. There's 66 photographers all together who contributed to the book, and it's more than 300 images. Um, and uh, most of them to Saskatchewan, but quite a few are from Alberta too. So, Myrna, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you tell, tell us a little bit about that and how, how this book got started. Yes, thanks, Trevor. Well, I was, as um, Jordan mentioned, the biologist at Ellis Bird Farm, and Charlie and Winnie Ellis, brother and sister pair, were among the first backyard bird feeding enthusiasts in Alberta. So they started back in the 1950s feeding birds. 
and Charlie Ellis would feed two tons of sunflower seeds every winter to the evening grass weeks. And they, he would actually go down to Bow Island and bring back truckloads of sunflower seeds. So when I first started at the bird farm, I thought, well, we should celebrate what Charlie and Winnie are doing and do a book about winter bird feeding because they fed only in the winter. And so I wrote a book called Winter Bird Feeding way back in 1991. It was just line drawing some black and white illustrations. And then that book sold out eventually and some bird stores in Alberta were saying, kept saying to me, we need an updated backyard bird feeding book. So that's what I did. I thought, well, we'll just turn it from winter bird feeding to year round bird feeding. And we will add some hummingbirds and rose breasted grass beaks and it'll be easy. And so when I got into the project as you know, these projects unfold, it became a huge endeavor. And I thought, oh, I don't have enough photographs. So I better put out a post on Facebook and just ask for photos. Well, we got over 800 photos. So we had the same issue that you had in Saskatchewan. The response was just incredible. And so the book went from 48 pages to 121. And we ended up putting it on the market. PV Mark came on board and it sold out in less than five months of first printing. So it's now in the third printing and it's doing very well. It has made Ellis Bird Farm over $100,000 profit. So Trevor, you so inspired me when I listened to your keynote address at a conference a couple of years ago, thought to myself, you know, it would be a great idea to work with this amazing naturalist to produce a book for Saskatchewan. So as you will recall, I walked up to you very bravely at a banquet and I said, Trevor, you don't know me, but I have a great idea. I think you should do this book for Saskatchewan. And the rest is history. Yeah, that was a great moment. I mean, that was a couple of years ago and uh, I kept it in the back of my mind, just kind of waiting for the time to be right and a few other things to clear up. And during the pandemic, it just seemed like the perfect time, didn't it? Like, as you know, people are paying way more attention to food than they used to. Yeah, so it was good for you and it was good for me because we were kind of stuck at home and we knew that bird seed sales were skyrocketing. And mm. of course, as you mentioned, people are at home. And so what a great time to encourage people to watch nature in their own backyards. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we're going to show a little video. Um, Myrna and I had a chance to to uh, talk in person here a week or two ago at, at, where we have property uh, east of Regina and where I teach some bird feeders. So it was a, a fun chance to sit down or, and look at some bird feeders that she brought and just look at the bird feeders I use and just talk about bird feeding in person. And uh, so we're going to run a video here for you. And I'm going to get my screen. I just want to make a disclaimer that I'm not going to quit my day job and become. <laughs> Uh, actress and we had a wonderful time with Trevor but I have to tell you the wind just about blew us all over yeah. and so thanks to Karen Trevor's long-suffering wife for being the videographer and his daughter Maya for putting these sound clips with the wind howling together into this video appreciate it okay. Trevor Trevor, it's great that on the prairies we have bird seed companies that actually grow seed and package seed and know the bird seed industry. And one of those is 200 Seeds of Tabor. So they've kindly sent us some packages here so we can just have a look at what they've yeah. sent because they have some great mixtures. Yes, yeah, so basically the wild finch mix it contains, so it's got niger seed. We didn't talk earlier about niger seed. Mm -hmm. So niger seed is an imported seed, which at one point was basically a large part of the bird seed market. However, it has been usurped by sunflower chips. Mm -hmm. So any bird that will eat niger seed, which is very expensive, mm -hmm. and it's heat treated, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the nutritional quality of it. So oh. now I say that the sunflower chips, any bird that will eat niger will eat sunflower chips, and sunflower mm -hmm. chips are super nutritious. And that's However, this is the wild niche. So we have the niger seed, and then they have the sunflower chip. They put in the canola seed, canary seed, and white millet. So again, those are the kind of down the list of preferences for the birds. Oh, okay. So this this is good though. So this yeah. is for the siskins and the goldfinches. Oh, yeah, so it is a good mix. 
Absolutely, it's I'm better. Try to, yeah. yeah. So it's better than the mix that you get at hardware stores, right? Because that right. contains the, the, the uh, green sorghum, red mile, which nobody eats but gambles yeah. quail yeah. and roadrunners, which we don't <laughs> have here in Saskatchewan. It's not about roadrunners. This says uh, no mess gardeners mix. Yes, mix. so this That's is an excellent mix. So again, what people love now is feeding the birds, but they don't really like the mess. Mm -hmm. So when you have the sunflowers, the, the, sun, the whole sunflowers, and you get the mess, so this is the no mess, and it contains, again, the sunflower chips, peanuts, uh, cranberries. Mm. Oh, no, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Yes, and then suet nuggets. Oh, so they have a bit of suet and a bit of wow. seeds mixed together. Yeah, so wow. that's a good mix. I've never seen that before. Yeah, no. Nope. So no that's mess. a no mess gardener. So you no can waste. do a trial on that one too. Nice. Finally, the bigger, bigger bag of the corn songbird mix, which looks like got some black oil sunflower seed, maybe? Yes. So this looks like it's got mm. everything but the kitchen sink. Okay, so black oil, canary grass seed, canola seed. So again, canola is up there with Niger. So the pine siskins and the red poles love canola. Huh. Um, and cracked corn, striped sunflower flower, flowers, and white and red millet. Again, mm -hmm. the millets are great in the spring for the migrating sparrows. So if you have the little juncos coming through and all your white crown and white throated sparrows, they love the millet. But millet really is just good for the migrating birds. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, so let's say something about canola because I, I mean, I know for sure you don't want to be treated canola. It's, it's got to be this kind of canola. Yeah. Right? So this will be the untreated canola. Yes, absolutely. You do not want coated to put stuff. the coated stuff. No, it's super like toxic. Yeah. Poisons on it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So those are some great mixes that people can use in the backyard yeah. or you can just go with sunflower seeds or sunflower chips. We've got a, really an assortment of really cool feeders you brought here. Okay, so them. you can see they're a little weathered. I just grabbed them from my yard at home. And so we talked earlier about the tray feeders, open tray feeders. Now, this is a great tree feeder. You can see it has a mesh in the bottom. So if the snow and rain on it, then it can it has a chance to dry. Okay. This is a great feeder to hang underneath your two feeders or any of your other feeders because it will catch the seeds and mm -hmm. have two chances before they hit the ground. Mm -hmm. So it's more efficient to catch. So you, you fill that up, it's not a huge you amount. Can. It'll no. last a day or so or a day or two and you might have to replace it again. Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. You can buy bigger ones, mm -hmm. but the great thing is, so it's kind of double. You can use it as a tray feeder or you can hang it underneath to catch, intercept the seeds yeah. underneath. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's cool. All right. And okay, so this is, we talked about this in the book. And this is just a genius invention. And these are the weight activated feeders. And wow. so those people who are bothered by blue jays and squirrels could simply adjust the weight on this so oh, that the weird. birds or the heavy squirrels land on here and their weight covers, puts the portal over the hole or the, mm -hmm. the perch over the portal. There, sealed. So the squirrel lands on it and it can't feed. Chickadee mm -hmm. lands, it can feed. Mm -hmm. So these are just a great way Mm -hmm. to enable the smaller birds to feed without having to worry about the big birds stealing it all. I love this guy, this is an unusual one. <laughs> yeah, so this is basically a squirrel, it's supposed to be a squirrel for a feeder. So this is how it's sold. And so it's metal, it's like this uh, chain mail. And so the interesting thing is the squirrels can still get the seeds out of it, but they can't wreck it. So that's one of the issues, the squirrels just ruin everything. So at least yeah. they can't chew mm -hmm. the metal. That's first yeah. Now I just threw this in because this is a genius bird feeding idea. Hmm. So if you want to hang your feeders high in a tree, you take your broom handle and you put it in here <gasps> and you reach way after it and hang it. Isn't that a oh. great invention? So there, people have really come up with some super ideas. <laughs> I looked at that and I thought, that's not yeah. going to fool any squirrels. No. Yes, so for feeding nuts, so either shell peanuts or peanuts even in the shell the birds can still peck so these are great again the squirrels can't chew them so they yes. just metal this nut that's dispenser metal. yeah so that's a good idea and yeah. i brought along just a little hummingbird feeder and these are wonderful these are made by perky pet so the idea is if you don't want to have your feeders bothered by the bees then you want a feeder where the stirrup is down below the level of the proboscis of the insect 
And so this level stays low. And so the hummingbirds can reach it. And then if you don't want the ants on it, this is such a genius idea, this is an ant moat. And so it's simply just a little upturned cup, fill it with water, and the ants can't eat it. But the chickadees will drink of it. So it's like a multi-purpose hummingbird, <laughs> hummingbird feeder chickadee water. So we talked about bird seeds a little, a little bit, but what about other kinds of food for, for birds who don't eat seeds? Yes, so we've got fruit and nectar. So great to see that you've got a couple orange halves to put out here. So orange halves are legally sought after. They also love to eat jelly. So grape jelly or apple jelly or crab apple jelly, any cake jelly you can buy. And I see that you've got the nectar too, and sugar water. So basically that covers it for the so it's basically four to one. You don't have to boil the water, but you have four, point, well, four parts water, one part sugar, nice hot, stir it around. You just heat it up so it's... Heat so it up nice and hot. You don't have to boil it. Okay. And just use small quantities at a time because it can go bad. Yeah. You know, it can you end up getting the mold and stuff in it. And so just, just spend a little bit at a time. Okay. And then as the birds use it, wash out the feeder and, and replenish the nectar. Okay. Now I've got I've got a few feeders. I've got actually I've got four on the property. Is that is that okay or is that I excessive? I think it's fine. What? So do you have a lot of Orioles here and a lot of hummingbirds? I mean, some years we'll get 10 to 15 hummingbirds. Oh my word. So well, you know, last so year wasn't as good, but that's why I usually yeah. put up for a few feeders. But otherwise they always seem like they're fighting. Yeah, the male they're hummingbirds always, of course yeah. are very pugnacious and great. it's great that you've got them spread around. So then can't, if you have them concentrated, of course, one extra pugnacious male will just chase everybody away. So this way, if you've got them spread around, you can't dominate all the feeders. Okay. And so you can spread the spread the nectar around, mm -hmm. and more birds can feed. All right. Now, what about cleaning? How often do you clean the feeders? Well, it depends on the weather. It depends on temperature. Depends on how much the birds are going to. I try and scrub mine every week or so. Oh yeah. And of course, never use brown sugar, never use honey. Right. right? Just always use white sugar. White sugar. And, the, or, and Orioles do seem to like orange, orange colored things. They do. Yeah. Do, do they I ever come know. and check your glasses out? Ah, uh, not yet, <laughs> but they might. Because <laughs> you know, hummingbirds are crazy, right? Yeah, You're wearing a red shirt. Yeah, they do all come in. I have a great story. I have a Buddhist friend who was meditating, and she meditated red, and a hummingbird came and put its little tongue up her nose. Unbelievable. So, I know. It is a yeah. true story. Is yeah. that right? It's very interesting. Amazing. So okay. the birds are amazing. And it's wonderful that we can supplement their natural food by putting food out for them in our own yards and gardens and bringing them in. Yeah. It's a wonderful way to get kids involved in nature. And it's just it's a great addition to our yards and gardens to have these birds close by. Before we get started again, Trevor, there was a lot of comments that your volume was really low. So either try just speaking up, putting the microphone closer to your mouth, and I think I've just muted you now, so you'll have to unmute before you get started again. Okay, how's that, Jordan? I'll try holding the mic closer to my mouth. This is a new, a new um, headphone and microphone. I think I'm going to have to take it back. Is that any better? It's louder, but now there's sort of some feedback in it that's kind of vibrating. Oh, no. Okay, how about, how about this? If I just talk really loud. <laughs> no, yeah, it's coming back with the feedback. So, um, okay, well, just a minute. I'm going to try unplugging and just going with. Computer sound first. 
No, now we got nothing. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know what else I can do. Can you hear me now at all? Can, it's quiet, at least it's not muffled. Yeah, it's a bit better. And you guys, how's this now, Jordan? Yep. Yep, for the most part, it's better there now again. Okay. Well, sorry about this, everybody. It's just the way it sometimes goes. Okay. We're going to do all the slides flow here. Um, one of the first images I wanted to show you is from the dedication to the book. We dedicated the book to one of Canada's greatest songbird banders, Mary Houston from Saskatoon. Mary died, as many people know, uh, a couple of years ago, but she was a tremendous bander of birds and uh, she kept bluebird trails in Saskatchewan. She loved the bluebirds especially. And uh, here in this image, you can see she's, she's holding a bohemian waxwing. And I, I have fond memories of being in the kitchen and looking out the window at her where she's got the mountain ash berries in the cage and attracting the the uh, the <laughs> wax wings and then and then processing them then in her kitchen and letting them out the kitchen window at a little hole that she had set up there. Anyway, loved loved Mary and she was just was a, a gentle soul with with the birds. So we dedicated the the book to her. Trevor. So we're going to look at some of the pictures in the book. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. I don't think we can see your slides. Okay. Well, that's a problem. All right. Well, we are definitely in the share. I was in share mode. Let's try again. All right. How's that? Uh, we can't yep. see that. Would it okay, be helpful you're going to have if... to do it there, Ellen. Yep, I'll, yeah, uh, Ellen. I'll share my screen, and then you can let me know when to uh, to um, switch the slides, okay? Sounds good. Okay. Oh, uh-oh. Now we have tech problems on this side. Here we go. All right, is that working for everybody now? Perfect. Yep. All right, yeah, I can go see ahead, it. let me know, and I'll switch them over for you. Okay, Alan, uh, advance it to uh, the, the next slide. So this is the picture I was talking about dedicating the book to Mary, to Mary Houston, who died in 2019. Uh, and uh, I won't repeat the whole story. I think people may have heard what I said, depending on the sound. But let's, let's move on to the next image. This is a, a photo of a Canada Jay, which uh, I think is now, uh, is it officially or unofficially, Myrna, uh, or Canada's national bird? I don't think it's been officially named, but I'm sure it soon will be. Yeah, yeah, which is, which is wonderful. I mean, who, who has traveled in the north and not seen one of these birds just show up when you stop to open up your pack for a picnic or, or, or make a breakfast when you're camping in the north? They're just, they're just, uh, such unique little spirits and they're hardy as can be like Canadians themselves. You know, they, they um, begin nesting. Well, how, how early would you say they nest, Myrna? In, I think in, they'll in, be nesting in our area in January and February. Yeah. So they've already got at, young flying out of the nest by now, wouldn't you say? Yeah. We were just at Prince Albert National Park and there were young Canada Jays everywhere flying around. Oh, that must have been great to see. And that's a bird that can be confusing for people, right? Because yeah, it is just very slate gray. Yeah, it doesn't look like the adults much. Okay, Ellen, let's let's uh, advance it to the next one. I love this slide. This the first picture was by Morley Mayer, 
a good friend of, of Myrna's and a fellow I know and a, a faithful um, board member of Nature Saskatchewan. But this image is by Denise Trashill. Two gray catbirds. Uh, say a little bit about, about feeding, feeding uh, fruit, uh, Myrna. Yes, so it seems that birds are developing an appetite for fruit. Even five years ago, it was very unusual to see Baltimore Orioles coming in for jelly or orange halves here at least in Alberta, and now it's very common. I have never seen gray catbirds come in. This is just like you said, an amazing photograph. And so obviously gray catbirds are another species that have adapted to what we offer them and they will eat both orange halves and jelly. Mm -hmm. And some of these birds like the Orioles and tanagers, I guess would eat, eat a lot of fruit and nectar on their wintering grounds, isn't that the case? It is. So it is kind of surprising with the catbirds, but they are very smart and very adaptable. And mm -hmm. so it's great that they've discovered orange halves and will now come into our backyards to, to partake. Yeah, a real shift in their sort of behavior. Yeah. Okay, Ellen, and advance us one more here. So this is a, a picture of a, a bird we will get in the winter and then moving through in migration spring and fall in southern Saskatchewan, but up in the boreal forest, you'll see them in their nesting grounds. This is a brown creeper. And you can see this one's got an insect in its tweezer-like bills, bill, very cryptically plumaged, sometimes hard to see. They kind of look, look like bark. This is a beautiful photo by Nick Saunders, a, a photographer from Sask Saskatoon. And they too are quite, sorry, I'll just mention about the creeper. They are quite common. I think more common than people realize, but like you mentioned, they're cryptically colored. And so they're easily, they're easily overlooked. They will come in to eat little pieces of suet that have dropped. They'll eat sunflower chips and they love what's called bark butter. We talk about this in the book. So it's just a mixture of peanut butter and fat together. If you put it right on the tree trunk, I've watched them come in and eat that. Interestingly, I had a friend who spent uh, money buying cheap hot dog buns, and he would let he dry the buns and <laughs> put them out on the in a suet dispenser. And the very addicted brown creepers ate hot dog buns winter after winter in his backyard. No, <laughs> probably not the best quality food, but probably not the best. I like the bark butter idea. I tried that myself this winter. Slap it on the peanut butter, and it really does work for them. And the, the nut hatches use it too. Okay, Ellen, love this photo. This is a rare species of oriole in Saskatchewan. Mernon, you probably get these in Alberta more than we do, right? This I, is a Bullock, Bullock's oriole. I have never seen one, only in the far south of the province. And this okay. is a fabulous picture. Who's the photographer on this one? This, this is Boyd Coburn. Uh, he's got some stunning photos, but he, just the design of this, by taking advantage of that, that feeder, which is often a peanut feeder, and he put slices of fruit in there. And the bullocks came. I mean, yeah, I, he's got some great shots of bullocks. We, we had to pick this, this one. I just like the arrangement and the fact that how the, the feet of it are holding the two different slices. Yeah. An amazing okay. photo. Yeah, yeah. Okay, man. Bird behavior is so interesting. You know, it's not just about having the bird in your yard or just feeding the bird, but the more you watch birds, the more you see unusual behavior. So what's going on in this photo, Myrna? This photo is of a thrasher dust bathing. And it is so interesting to watch these birds dust bathe. And so they will sometimes dust bathe, which means they just get some little patch of dust and they just shake the dust all over their feathers, or they will sunbathe. Now this bird may be also sunbathing. And when mm -hmm. they sunbathe, they basically go into a trance. They just lay there as if they're dead or unconscious and the sun shines on their feathers. They open up their feathers so the sun hits their skin. And it's believed that probably the ectoparasites then are forced off their skin and they can feed on them. They can eat them off. Huh. So it's a wonderful thing to watch, both dust bathing and sun bathing. And in the winter, I've actually watched red poles snow bathe. They will just vigorously bathe in, in, a, in the dry snow. Yeah, I think we got a picture of that in the, in the book too of house sparrows. So this is a picture by Gloria Polyak. All right, Ellen, pass this on to the next one. Oh, here we go. This is a bird that's pet moving right through everybody's neighborhoods in southern Saskatchewan. 
right now. It's a Swainson's thrush photo again by Denise Trastial. And uh, we have a fair bit in the book about water and the importance of water in the backyards, Myrna. Maybe you'd like to say a little bit about that. Yes, actually, more species are attracted to water in a backyard than are to bird supplemental food. Water is critically important, not only for them to drink, but also to bathe. So the sound of moving water is important. So they'll come into just a little bird bath like this one shown here, but they do love the sound of moving water. So you can get a little solar bubbler or you can make a little stream mm -hmm. and have the sound of moving water to bring them in. And you mentioned behavior. And one of my favorite things to do is just sit and watch birds bathe. It's so mm -hmm. energetic, it's so enthusiastic, and they really put a lot of energy into bathing. So yeah. it's wonderful to have this addition in your backyard, a bird bath or uh, just a little bird. You can just use a, a dog dish or a specialized bird bath. In the winter, you can get a heated bird bath, so they all drink all winter long. Mm. So it is a good addition. Yeah, I liked what you said about just just enjoying watching them bathe. There's, you know, there's the behaviors of birds. Just watching them at feeders in in water is one of those things that really. Well, there's, psychologists are starting to examine this now about how watching birds can really help us regulate our emotions in stressful times. Okay, let's let's move it on, Ellen, to the next one. Love this photo by this was by uh, Lauren Scott. He, this is his farm near Indian Head, where he was feeding feeding uh, evening grass beaks. And you can see he's innovated at his bird feeder to catch the food underneath the feeder. He's got the lid to an old canister of some kind of probably farm chemical or something like that, or maybe seed, I don't know. Anyway, uh, evening grass beaks. You were saying that on the Ellis farm, they used to get lots of them. Is that the case anymore or? is not the case anymore. So they, over the last 30 years, have virtually disappeared from central Alberta. Once in a while, I'll walk outside and I will hear the beautiful song of an evening grass beak. But they're a species that really has suffered huge declines, especially across the southern part of their range. Yeah. So it is a great thrill to be able to see them. Mm -hmm. And yes, Charlie would literally use a scoop shovel to scoop shovel out the sunflower seeds into cattle troughs and thousands of evening grass beaks would descend to feed. Unbelievable. That, that may never be seen again. Yeah, that's, that's too bad. This is a great picture. I really enjoy seeing the, the old farm lid. Mm -hmm. Great. You can be creative. You don't yeah. have to pay big money for a bird feeding. No. Bird feeder. No, you can be innovative. Okay, uh, on to the next one. Lovely photo of a fox sparrow by Harold Fisher who lives up close to Prince Albert National Park, and you were visiting him recently. But fox sparrows, I just want to say, we've had a terrific spring with fox sparrows. More sightings of fox sparrows in Regina area, for sure, and I think much of southern Saskatchewan than usual. I don't know why in particular, but um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, look at this photo. Okay, if you look carefully, on the back of this great horned Owl, and this is a photo uh, by Jordy Braun. If you look at the back of it, there's a bird there. This is a fierce little defender, uh, a flycatcher, the western kingbird. And you'll see eastern and western kingbirds this time of year through summer. Very, very pugnacious birds chasing away any raptors, ravens, and crows in, in their neighborhood. But uh, again, Myrna, a great, a great bird behavior picture. It is. The other thing that I could just mention is that if some of these predator birds come in, of course, the birds will mob like this very pugnacious kingbird. So they'll just, the chickadees will sometimes just mob a, a predator. Mm -hmm. But a couple of weeks ago, I walked out of my house and I looked at my Katoni aster and there were six little chickadees in there and they were, every one of them, as if they were frozen. I looked wow. up on the other trees, the downy woodpeckers, no bird was moving a muscle. So if a sharp-shinned hawk comes through or a bird that they're really threatened by, one of their behaviors is to freeze. And that in itself is really interesting to watch because you know that there's somebody around because those birds are not moving a muscle. Okay, so you're saying if you see birds freeze at a, in a, your yard or in a feeder, take a look at the sky. Or yeah. take, take a look no. around and okay. you'll probably have a sharp-shinned or a cooper's hawk around. Wow, very cool. Okay, next one. Oh, 
Here's an amazing photo. Uh, Lazuli or Lazuli bunting by Bob Schultz. What do you say, Lazuli or Lazuli, Myrna? Lazuli. I okay. don't know if it's correct. <laughs> <laughs> which comes from lapis lazuli, the uh, gemstone, and, and which is very similar to the color on this bird. It's not a common bird at feeders, but do people see them in, in uh, Alberta at all at bird feeders, Myrna? Very seldom, very seldom. There's been a couple reports just this week here in Saskatchewan, uh, one including here in Regina. Uh, a, a good friend of mine took some lovely photos of them and put them, I think they're on the Sask Birders Facebook page. But yeah, a stunning bird. If you get a chance to see them, you have a better chance if they don't show up in your yard to just go out to some of the, the creek and river valleys of Southern Saskatchewan. Uh, certainly south of the number one highway seems to be the best, best area for them in the river valleys. Okay, uh, next one. Ah, Myrna, this is finally one of your photos. So I had the great good fortune to go to Point Pelee three years ago and went to one of the bird feeders in the provincial park there and was just amazed about, amazed to seeing all of the Baltimore Orioles coming into the feeders. They fed so much grape jelly. As you can see here, they had to get jars of Welch's grape juice that they poured upside down into a special feeder that dispensed the grape jelly. And they had to replace it several times a day. So these birds are a little bit of like addicts, I thought. But mm. anyway, it was a great photo op because there were dozens and dozens of these Orioles around. And as mm. I mentioned earlier, the Baltimore Orioles five or 10 years ago, if somebody had one at an orange half or grape jelly, it was you know, topic of conversation. We'd phone mm -hmm. each other and talk about it. Now it's super common. These birds have just learned across their range that it's great to be able to come into a backyard bird feeding station and take advantage of, like you said, hummingbird feeders or oriole feeders or orange halves or jelly. And it doesn't have to be grape jelly. It can be any kind of jelly. Hmm. Cool. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. <laughs> Here we go. So sometimes in your backyard, even at the water, you'll get birds that aren't songbirds at all. This is a fairly large hawk. This is a photo by Kathy Cox of a subadult northern goshawk, a real wild predatory hawk from the north that will come south in the winter. Now, what about having, getting hawks that come to your feeders? It's kind of a mixed blessing, isn't it, Mer? I mean, we do hear people concerned about, about raptors showing up in their, in their bird feeding setup. Yes. So this goshawk, Kathy was is a good friend of mine, and she was just walking out behind her house and just happened to have her camera and looked up, and here was this goshawk taking a drink. More commonly, it would come in and take the ringneck pheasants and the other birds in her yard. And mm -hmm. these predatory birds have increased in number. As you well know, the Sharpshin and Cooper's hawk have increased in number and range throughout North America, largely because we offer them food at our bird feeding stations <laughs> and a bird like the Merlin can cause, I believe some population declines because they have a huge appetite for backyard birds. And mm. so they do have an impact, but they're still part of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. On we go, Ellen. All right, Myrna, this is another one of your photos. I just love this photo. I want the full story of how you got this, this incredible image. Okay, so I have a lot of disappointments in my hours spending, you know, freezing to death taking pictures. So often the birds never show up. I miss the picture. This is a window killed little white breasted nuthatch. And this shrike had been hanging around our friend's yard for many days. And so I sat, as I mentioned, and it sounded like I was whining and I was because I froze my fingers and froze my toes and day after day of disappointments. And then one day I just lucked out and this shrike came down for the window killed nut hatch. And I was mm. there at the right moment. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's just such an amazing photo. Okay. Yeah. On we go. Uh, lovely shot here by Boyd Coburn again. This is uh, the red shafted flicker. We more commonly in Saskatchewan, most of Saskatchewan, we see the yellow shafted. In Alberta, I guess, would you have both too? We do. And now their integrades are showing up everywhere. Look out the window and you'll say, well, that's half yellow shafted, half red shafted. The mixes are 
very commonly seen now. Mm -hmm. And you can really see how it got its name. All of those feather shafts. I've never seen a photo that shows the shafts of a, of a red shafted or any flicker so well as this one. Boyd did, Boyd did an amazing job. And these birds are increasing in number and now overwintering very commonly, at least in Alberta. Again, mm, 10 years yep. ago, if you saw a flicker, it'd be big news. Now it's like, oh, there's another flicker. Yeah, they seem to be overwintering, overwintering in Saskatchewan more too. Okay, uh, on we go, Ellen. All right, Myrna, another one of your photos. I just love this one. It's, uh, there's, there's a comic kind of a feel to it. Thanks, Trevor. So we have this pair of pillated woodpeckers in our yard that are just super tame. And I have one other picture. I don't think it made it into the book, but on the other side of this little feeder was a black capped chickadee. And one cold morning I watched the pileated woodpecker in the chickadee. And of course the pileated woodpecker is huge and big birds tend to scare off small birds. And so the little chickadee would come in and the pileated would reach over to grab for the seeds and the chickadee would fly off. And it only took the chickadee about five minutes to go, wow, I don't have to fly off. I can just stay and swing on the other side of this feeder. And so the pileated happily fed on one side, you can see it would stick out its tongue, very sticky, grab the sunflower chips. And the little chickadee would just ride on the other side and continue feeding. Mm. And so these are just our resident woodpeckers and you can see how creative they are. In fact, mm -hmm. I had one here this morning, I was looking out at it and it had to do a lot of pondering about how it was gonna hang upside down and reach just a certain way to grab the, the seeds out of the new feeder that I've got out there. Do they, do they particularly like those sunflower chips? They love the sunflower chips. Now I have watched them eat the full seeds, the sunflower, the shell, unshelled seeds, but they love these chips. They devour mm. the chips and they must really love them because there's lots of in insects for them right now. And they're still coming in yeah. to eat the seeds, the chips. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Cool. Okay. Uh, next, next photo. Oh, this is of course a lot of female and I think perhaps some sub-adult or juvenile ruby-throated hummingbirds. This photo was taken by a friend of mine, Brian Sternberg, actually at our bird feeders a couple of years ago out, of, out uh, where we have land in the country. And uh, yeah, it was a good year. We had a lot of ruby throats all vying for, for the three or four feeders that, that we had up. And uh, Jared Clark, bird bander and uh, extraordinary birder came out and uh, did some banding that year of, of hummingbirds as well, which is lots of fun. Have you ever, have you ever done hummingbird banding, Myrna? I have, I've watched, but I have never done it myself. Now, are they yeah. at an Oriole feeder here? Isn't that ironic? That, yeah, that's an Oriole feeder, but it seems, seems to be very popular with them. I have, I have the red version of this for the hummingbirds and then the orange one for the Orioles, but they seem to use, use both. And sometimes the Orioles will use the hummingbird feeder and vice versa. Yeah. Great. Okay. Oh, here's a, here's a photo that I just love this because of the subtlety of it and reminds us that the beauty of birds is just really so much about how much attention you pay and how close you look at them. Because, you know, a bird that without binoculars or without your telephoto lens might just look like a drab brown bird. When you see it like, like Rachel Ling did here with her, this photo, you really see the rich complex shadings and the hues in a bird's plumage and that that incredible eye surrounded by black i it just i really like this photo what do, what do you think and how do you how do you get photos like this myrna uh, i delete a lot of bad pictures so <laughs> this is a rusty blackbird i too have just discovered rusty blackbirds at feeders at kathy cox's actually they had a couple of them over winter so you just have to spend the time and i think for photography it's a really good idea to know the birds, study the birds, be patient, watch and anticipate because often you'll think, okay, this bird is going to sing, this bird might preen, this bird's going to land on a favorite perch, it might stretch. And so you just watch and wait and take a lot of pictures and delete a lot of pictures. Hmm. This well, is an excellent, I, is, I don't think this is my picture, but. No, this is Rachel so, Ling. Right. So it yeah. is a beautiful shot. Like you say, subtle, but super beautiful. Yeah. Okay, next one is our final photo. It's one of yours, Myrna. I want you to say a little bit more about photography because this is just such a stunning photo. And, you know, I have tried to take pictures of birds like this. These are very fast, little nervous birds. Brown creepers, same thing. I've had 
they've given me fits trying to take pictures of them. How, what, any tips at all for how you how you work with birds that are, that are this you know mobile? Genetic. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it is a lot of luck. I have the world's largest collection of feet and tails and parts of beaks. <laughs> so I miss so many photos, but the picture of this little golden crown kinglet was again bark butter. So at my cabin north of Rimby, I tried putting out bark butter and on a beautiful sunny day, I just sat and watched and waited. And there were two males there coming in to feed and one seemed to have just a little bit of issue with the other male coming in, put up his little crown and I was able to snap the picture. Yeah, so yeah, because it took a lot of time. Yeah, so often you get a picture of a golden crown and you'd hardly see the crown, but this one, it's really, really aroused and you can see it fully. Wonderful. All right, Ellen, I think that's our last last photo. So we can uh, go back to just looking at us. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I'm hoping that there's been some, some questions come in. Jordan is gonna uh, share some questions with Myrna and I. We'll try our best to, to uh, give some helpful answers about birds and bird feeding. We've got a couple come in and hopefully uh, people are uh, ready to put questions in as opposed to watching the beautiful photos and the great stories. Um, okay. First question is, how do you get the oranges out, or put them out, I guess would, would have been what they are meaning, and how long do you leave them out? Well, I'm going to leave that up to Canada's best bird feeding expert here, Myrna. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think you just have to play it a bit by ear. Put it out, wedge it on a nail or on a, a little tree branch, and just watch if it's dried out or the birds are coming to it you know don't put 10 orange halves out until the birds are starting to come in once they get started just watch and if it does get dried out then obviously you just have to replace it but it's yeah. a matter of just putting stuff out there and hoping that the birds find it mm -hmm. and and they do you know there's lots of orioles around these days and what i've noticed is that once they do find it it's only a day or two and you've got to replace that slice of orange because they, they go through it very fast. All right, Jordan. Okay. Uh, one is just a comment about bird bats. Uh, uh, indicate that, yeah, if you can try to not have them too deep. Uh... Yeah, about depth, Myrna. Yeah, so you just want it very shallow. So the commercial bird bats are all shallow and they usually have a little raised center. If you're worried about, like, so they only need an inch to an inch and a half. And so if you're worried about it being deeper, for example, a dog dish, just put some rocks in and just create it, the spaces so that especially those tiny birds can bathe in that really shallow water. And you'll have to clean it out again regularly and top it up with fresh water, often daily. Mm hmm Okay. Another one, Jordan? I see one here. How do you prevent the magpies from taking over the bird feeders and chasing the other birds away? Very good question. So the only way that we came up with at the bird farm, well, there's two ways. One is to build an exclusion feeder and it's actually pretty simple. You can just hang your suet and around the suet enclose the, the, uh, the suet, hanging suet with stucco wire, just a stucco wire mesh that the, and the magpies can't get in. The other genius idea is to just take a bicycle rim, hang, straighten some coat hanger wire, hang it around about eight inches apart, put your suet feeder in so that the, the um, bicycle rim is around and the hangers are down and those magpies cannot come in to land on the suet feeder. So those are two ways that work very well. Great tips. Good, good. Okay. So I'm just going to interrupt quick. I just got a quick message. Jordan has lost his internet connection. <laughs> so he will not be reading any more questions out for you. Okay. Um, I can do that, but I've also lost my place. So um, Myrna and Trevor, can you see some of the questions that are coming in? Yes, I see, see one. Okay, go, ahead, go ahead, Myrna. Well, this is a question that I certainly can answer. Sure, go ahead. It's not a bird feeding question, but I get dead tree swallows in my birdhouses. In the spring, when I clean out the house, I often have a couple of dead swallows in several of my boxes. They will be under the nest when I clean them out. Why? 
what happens is tree swallows have very weak feet. And so it's super important on the inside panel of your bird box to put in some little saw curves so that the tree swallows can uh, get some purchase to get up and out. Now, bluebirds have fairly strong feet and large feet, and they generally don't have a problem. But these little tree swallows, especially in the spring when they're weak during bad weather, if they can't get back out of that box, they will just basically uh, starve to death inside of it. So again, really important to just make little saw etches underneath the entrance hole so they can get their little tiny feet in to get out. That is why you find dead tree swallows in your bird boxes. Interesting. I didn't know that. That's I've, I've seen them dead too in, in some of my tree boxes and I just thought something else, you know, not a lack of food or fro frozen or something. Okay, another question. Are glass hummingbird feeders better than plastic? I'm not sure. I think they're both fine. The plastic will deteriorate. The humming, the glass will last longer. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of quality, they're probably equal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we were talking about water a minute ago, mostly about this putting water out in the summer. But what about tips for winter? We talk about that a bit in the book, but maybe say, say a bit about that now. Yeah, so our winter birds are well adapted to eating snow in the winter. You probably watch the red poles, little chickadees, they will just literally eat snow. But if we have water, op open water for them, then it takes less energy for them to just drink the water than to have to ingest the snow and it melt, right? So they, there's less energy expended if they can just drink water. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that the two introduced species, house sparrows and European starlings, have been observed bathing when it's like 30 below, and then they freeze to death. So it's interesting that that behavior of bathing when it's too cold to do so safely hasn't been, you know, excluded or bred out of their gene pool. Mm -hmm. But you will never find a chickadee or a waxwing bathing when it's dangerously cold. They know when it's safe to drink. And they know when, ooh, it's too cold of a day to have a bath. And hmm. so you can put out water in the winter and the birds will come in on a warm day, they'll bathe. Otherwise, they'll just come in for a little sip of water to drink. Mm -hmm. now you've, you've written uh, books about landscaping and naturescaping for, for birds and nature. But there's a question here about birds eating Saskatoon bushes. Do you have any thoughts on, on how we handle that? I don't, other than netting, I'm not sure. Yeah. Birds love Saskatoons. I know. You know, you know what, what I always think is you need more Saskatoons. <laughs> that's yeah, that's the kind of how it works. If you've got lots, then there'll be some for the birds and some left over. If you only have like six or 10 bushes, birds are going to get them all. Yeah, you have to share. It, yeah. Sorry, I don't have a cut and dried solution. No. But no. certainly the having lots of Saskatoons is a great idea. Right. Well, I don't think there's any more questions coming in. Are there? Uh, I don't see any there. But, you know, before we go, I, I just wanted to um, go over because sometimes this time of year, people will find injured birds uh, and whether they've hit a window or something else. So what are the basic guidelines when you think a bird has been injured? Yeah, so most of the time the bird is injured, as you mentioned, it's not dead. And so the best thing to do is to go out and gently pick it up, put it in a shoe box, a dark box, put a little tissue or a little towel and just leave it for an hour or so. In most cases, it will come to and you can let it fly off. Now, the interesting thing in many cities is that cats are the real threat because a cat will hear a window thud. And it'll know that a bird just hit the window. So it'll race over and eat the bird while it's still alive mm -hmm. because it knows it's stunned. And so getting the bird immediately, as quickly as possible, is very important. Mm -hmm. Now, if it does die, then I think we've got information in the book. It can be given to science or to the university. But in most cases, if you could just grab it and get it into a dark, cool location, give it an hour, it, you'll be surprised at how tough these little birds are are and it'll just fly off yeah 
All right, we have a question came in. Speaking of window strikes, uh, someone saying that is that she has noticed that unfortunately, since she started feeding birds, the number of strikes has increased. So I think yeah. you've got an answer for that. And we were talking about this the other day, you and I. Yes. So window strikes are a huge issue. And the best thing to do is to have your bird feeders either within one meter of the window glass or more than four meters away. If it's in between that distance, then that's when most of the window strikes end up being fatal. So the birds scatter, they don't have time to veer off. So they hit the window and it ends badly for them. The thing about window strikes is you have to make sure the window is known to the bird to be a solid surface. And so if a bird sees a house plant on, in your living room, it thinks it can just fly through and land on it. If it sees a reflection, then it thinks that it can just fl continue flying. Or if it can see right through from one window to the other, it'll think that it can just fly through. So you have to make sure your windows are seen by the birds as being a solid surface. Now, Trevor, at your place, you've got the string hanging and blowing in the wind, and that can help. You can get the infrared decals to put on, and that has been known to help. But the most efficient solution is what's called feather-friendly window care, window treatment. Mm -hmm. We have the information in the book. And basically, it's just a bunch of dots. So it's like a big roll of tape that has dots on it. And you just, it comes with the measuring system and you just roll out the dots across your glass. And yep. that is proven to stop window strikes. Yeah. Everybody wants dots on their windows. But you know what? You get used to it. It doesn't bother you after a while. Yeah. You, you just see right past so, it. Yeah. yeah. Page 61 in the book, we've got all kinds of uh, tips on, on how to prevent window strikes. But if a bird gets injured, you know, we've got in Saskatchewan places like Salt Haven West here in Regina and uh, a place in Saskatoon that um, Jan Shattuck runs, Living Sky. Excellent places for, for uh, rehabilitating injured birds. Well, I think we're probably at the end of our hour here, Myrna. Okay. Did we mention where this book can be bought? Oh, we, we should do that. We should do that. Yes. Thank you very much for that reminder. Okay. okay so... You can certainly order them online through Nature Saskatchewan on their website. They've got a nice web page to help you do that. And they, they will deliver them if you want, or you can, you can pick them up yourself at the office here in Regina. But then there's several bookstores that have them, Turning the Tide in Saskatoon, McNally Robinson in Saskatoon, and then uh, Early's um, Farm and Garden Store has them as well. And here in Regina, um, Penny University Bookstore on 13th Avenue is selling them. We're hoping they will get into PV Mart soon. There's 12 outlets for PV Mart all over the province. And uh, PV Mart has agreed to put them on the shelves. Um, I'm sure they'll be there shortly. Um, probably missing a couple other Esther other Hazy outlets. Pharmacy. Oh, yeah. The Esther Hazy Pharmacy has them. And there's a pet shop, D&K or something, pet shop in Moose Jaw. I wish I could remember the name. But there's a, there's a pet store there that has is selling um the chin ridge foods and so they've got they've got the um the book there and birds unlimited in saskatoon one of our right we just said. thank you didn't want to forget them great store you can get a lot of those feeders we've been talking about there all right well thank you very much much myrna i think we're uh thank you Trevor. wrapping it up it's it's been a tremendous journey with you and uh i would do it all over again <laughs> there you go i might come up with another idea Okay. But I do want to just say a special thank you again to Donna Bruce at Nature Saskatchewan and, and Jordan and his team for helping. Yeah. And we had other people that were so supportive. Your daughter looked after all the photos, which is a huge undertaking. We had Carolyn Sandstrom fuss with all the pictures. We had Judy Fuschi, our graphic designer, who was infinitely patient in getting mm -hmm. this book final. We, we had some, you know, we, there was a lot of work to get it to perfection, she, which we yes, hope it is now. Good. Yeah. yeah and so a big thanks to to everyone who helped with this and i hope it sells well and makes nature saskatchewan lots of money and be prepared for another idea at the next conference when you see me coming across the banquet <laughs> hall there might be another plan another okay. idea all right i look forward to it take care oh, Marina.
before we go, uh, I just wanted to say thanks to Trevor and Myrna for you both. This was a really great, a uh, little bit more than an hour, really informative. Um, and I also wanted to note that we are trying to update all the retail locations on the Nature Saskatchewan website. And as they're kind of uh, coming online, we're going to be putting them up there. So if you're wondering if there's a location kind of near you, a retail location, just check the website and uh, it'll be there. And uh, we will have this uh, presentation up on YouTube within the next week or so. So okay. you can find it there. All right. Thank well, thanks. You. Thanks, Alan, for keeping us uh, doing this right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.